And so in the last couple of chapters, we've seen Moses in the role as the uh, mediator between holy God and the rebellious, sinful Israelites. Uh, they uh, were worshiping the gold calf. They talked Aaron into making this gold calf, and Moses is on Mount Sinai. He comes down with the tablets, the Ten Commandments. He sees what they're doing. He breaks them. And God says, okay, I'm going to move my presence from the midst of the camp, outside the camp. And Moses has been praying, Lord, if you don't go with us to the promised land, then we're not even going to go. What's the use if you're not with us? So God does tell him, I will go with you and I'll bring you into the promised land. And so Moses, you know, after he says, I want to see your glory um, in chapter 33, verse 19, God tells him, I will make my goodness pass before you but you will not see my face because nobody can see me and live. And so I'll put you in the cleft or the cave of the rock on Mount Sinai. And as I pass by, I'll remove my hand and you'll see my backside, probably the afterglow as God passes by. And as he passes by, he reveals his name, as we saw in chapter 34, verses 4 through 6 there. And um, his name reveals his nature, his character, he says, as he passes by, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgressions, and sin. But then he also tells them he will, you know, come against those who hate him, those who reject his word. After all, God is righteous, he is holy, he is just. And if people reject the Lord, if they refuse to accept his free gift of salvation, then they will face judgment. People today will face judgment if they don't humble themselves and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So we left off with Moses worshiping the Lord, and then he asked the Lord to forgive and pardon the sins of these stiff-necked people. And so as we pick up in chapter 34, verse 10, we'll see uh, God's grace in action as he will renew his covenant with the Israelites basically giving them a do-over, giving them a second chance, a third chance, fourth chance. I mean, how many chances do we need? But again, we see this throughout the Bible when, when we are unfaithful, when we stumble and fall, God remains faithful. You know, He knows we're weak. He knows we're but dust. And so He will always keep His word. And another thing we'll see with Moses is that spending time with the Lord is contagious. As you spend time in the presence of the Lord, you want to spend more time. You want to seek more of Him. You want to know Him to a greater degree. That's why He's given us His Word. Psalm 27, verse 4, David says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. In other words, there's nothing better than being in the presence of God being with godly people who love the Lord. You're, you're stirring each other up to love and good works, seeking His face. So what Moses is saying is, I want to spend this time with you. So initially he says, Lord, show me your way. And then he says, Lord, please show me your glory. And so we should desire that same thing. Lord, I just want to know you more. I just want to understand your word more. I just want to grow in my relationship with you more. Help me, Lord, to apply your word to my everyday life. And as we grow in the Lord, as we learn to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, rather than relying on our flesh to see us through, we will walk in victory and not in defeat. And so it's an ongoing process as we grow and mature in our relationship with Jesus. There's no shortcuts, by the way. There's no gimmicks. There's no how to become spiritual in four easy steps. It doesn't work that way. It all comes down to a deep desire within our hearts to draw closer to Jesus. I mean, the outline for how we should be living, it's Acts 2.42. Uh, we'll probably go into the book of Acts after we finish Exodus, but it's the outline. It says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What is that? That's the Word of God. They were steadfastly in the Word of God and fellowship. Again, stirring each other up to love and good works in the breaking of bread and in prayers. But with Moses, everything about his relationship with God has been dramatic. I mean, it's just been over the top. How did Moses first meet the Lord? A burning bush. 
And there's, you know, you don't have burning bushes on fire and somebody talking to you from the midst of it. That didn't happen very often. It only happened once. And that was God saying, Moses, take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. Who are you, Lord? I am that I am. And so God reveals himself in a dramatic way. In a dramatic way, he sets the Israelites free from Egypt, the ten plagues. I mean, he's seen all these things. Moses has been right in the midst of it all. As they get to the Red Sea, he just raises up his staff. God parts the Red Sea. They go on dry land, one thing after another. God has you know, given them the pillar of fire by uh, night, the pillar of cloud by day. They've had manna coming down from heaven, water from the rock. I mean, God has been doing one unique thing after another. And we need to recognize these things are very unique to Moses. But here's something else to consider. As followers of Jesus Christ, we've been given many great and precious promises as well. When you came to Jesus, he died on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood for your sins. And when you gave your life to him, he has washed you clean. He has made you a new creation in Christ. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. He has given you His Holy Spirit. You're signed, sealed, and delivered into the body of Christ. You know, He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The Spirit is producing the fruit of love, joy, and peace in our hearts and our minds. And so He's done all these things for us, and He's not done with any of us yet. I know He's not done with you. I know he's not done with me. I just got to look in the mirror and it's like, wow, I got a long way to go, Lord. But we're in that sanctification process. Yes, we're justified. We're being sanctified. Eventually, we're going to be glorified. You know, when the rapture takes place, we're going to receive our resurrection bodies and it's going to be amazing. And so God wants us to be spending that time with him in his presence. And it's not goofy. It's not weird. I mean, a lot of people, it's like they got to try to set the mood. You know, let's burn some incense. Let's set the lighting just right. Let's, you know, turn, you know burn some candles. Let, you know, let's, uh, you know, put on soft music. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not how you draw closer to the Lord. Um, you know, I just mentioned, you know, we just got back from Tennessee a couple weeks ago. Everybody in Gatlinburg is wearing Christian T-shirts. It was amazing. I've never seen so many Christian T-shirts in my life. And, and it was funny, though, because this one gal walked by, Elizabeth, and I look at her, and she's like, started chuckling because it's like, all I need is sweet tea and Jesus. <laughs> that, that sums it up. I just like, all I need is coffee in the morning and, and my Bible. I'm good to go. That, that's what we're doing. We're growing in that relationship with him. So look at chapter 34. We'll pick up in verse 10. It says, and he said, the Lord speaking, behold, I make a covenant. Again, he's renewing his covenant with them after they blew it. Behold, uh, before all your people, I will do marvels such as they have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I am driving out from before you the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Parasite. No, Parasite and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going. Take note of that. Don't make a covenant with the people of this sinful world, lest it be a snare in your midst. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. For you shall worship no other god for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they play the harlot with their gods and make a sacrifice to their gods and one of them invites you in and you eat of his sacrifice and you take of his daughters for your sons and his daughters play the harlot with their gods and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. You shall make no molded gods for yourself. So pause there for a moment. And again, this is God renewing his covenant with the Israelites and we see God has just revealed his name to Moses. Again, the Lord, the Lord God, gracious and merciful, you know, slow to anger, bounding in goodness and truth. And true to his name, the Lord extends tremendous grace and goodness to these undeserving Israelites who had just rebelled against him. But again, that's his nature. That is his character. He did not create us because he hates us. 
He created us because he loves us. There's the extreme end of Calvinism where it says God created people to throw them in the lake of fire, to burn for eternity. That's not why he created anybody. He created us because he loves us and he wants us to come into relationship with him. That's the whole purpose of Jesus coming from heaven to earth, to die for the sins of the world. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16. He gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, are you a whosoever? Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's why Jesus came. If people reject him, they'll put themselves in the lake of fire, so to speak. But God has done everything for us. He loves us. He created us for fellowship, even as he created Adam and Eve for fellowship. And so here, God renews his covenant with these people, and you'll notice that God repeats himself, and you might think, why does he repeat himself? Because he's already said all these things to them and us, as Moses was on the Mount Sinai for 40 days, 40 nights. He breaks the two tablets of stone. When he sees the gold calf, and they're worshiping the gold calf, he's going to go back up. Well, he's been called to go back up with two new tablets, and God is going to write on those tablets the Ten Commandments as well. So he repeats himself, not because he forgets. God never forgets anything. He knows everything. But it's to remind us, it's to remind the Israelites, what I said still applies. What I promised is still valid. God does not change his mind. And so my word still stands. That's essentially what he's telling Moses here. Even though the people have rebelled, even though they have been unfaithful, I remain faithful and true and gracious and merciful. So again, in verse 10, God says, I will do marvels or wonderful works. He's going to do more miraculous things, not only before leading them out of Egypt and up to this point, but even when they blow it and they don't go into the promised land, remember where they were in Egypt to the promised land is like a week journey. They'll end up walking around for 40 years because they did not go into the promised land. They send in the 12 spies, Joshua and Caleb come back, and they say, God's given us the land, we just need to go in and take it. And the other 10 said, no, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. They're going to kill us. We can't do it. There's giants there. And so, because of their unbelief, they did not enter in. But God still did miraculous things. He still gave them manna from heaven every day, twice on Friday. He still gave them water from the rock. He, it says that even after the 40 years, their sandals never wore out. I bet Teva wished they had that patent. Teva, their sandals never wore out. He would bring them in across the Jordan River under Joshua. He'll back up the Jordan River. It dries up. God still does marvelous things. They go march around Jericho. God brings the walls down. He'll even stop the sun and the moon in their orbit for a time so that Joshua could defeat the enemies. I mean, God did one thing after another, and it would all, you know, accumulate during the three and a half years of Jesus' earthly ministry. When he would come on the scene, he would open blind eyes, open deaf ears, cast out demons, cleanse lepers, feed the multitudes with the little boy's lunchable. I mean, he did one miracle after another. He even raised people from the dead. So all the miraculous things, the marvelous things, as it says here, I will do marvels, it all culminates with Jesus when he came from heaven to earth. And even though most of the Jewish people rejected their Messiah, God has always been faithful to stand up with the Jewish people. And he's always had a remnant. And even though the Jews in Israel are mostly in unbelief today, God is not finished with the Jewish people. This is why we stand with Israel. They need to come to Jesus. They need to know him as their Messiah. Until then, we need to keep praying that guys like Amir Sarfati and others over there, and we have a team right now. Craig and Jody are there. Uh, um, Kenan, not Kenan, Kellen <laughs> and Becca, they just flew over yesterday to Israel, and they're going to be working with some of the IDF soldiers who've been wounded. They're going to be helping pick crops. They're going to be doing things just to show the love of Jesus to the Jewish people. So don't ever give up on them. You know, even though they were dispersed from their land in 70 AD, General Titus and the Roman Legion, they come into Israel, into Jerusalem, 
They destroy the temple. They killed a million Jews from 70 AD. They're scattered throughout the world until May 14th, 1948. And God said he was going to bring them back into his land. There's no such thing as Palestine, by the way. It's a made-up name that the wicked Hadrian, the emperor of Rome in 135 AD, took the name Israel, got rid of it because he hated the Jews, and he called it the Philistinia, after the Philistines, because those were the notorious uh, enemy of Israel. So that name, the Philistinia, became known as the Palestine, Palestinia. And so it's funny, because Amir posted, I don't know, way back, this young gal in Gaza, and she was so excited to get her DNA back because she did a DNA study. And she was convinced it's going to be 100% Palestinian. There's no such thing. So it comes back, it's 80% Jordanian, 20% Egyptian. That's what they all are, by the way. Mostly Jordanian, mostly Egyptian. There's no such thing as Palestine. When the Jews came, were there, even 1900, before it became a state, they were called Palestinian Jews, and they were Palestinian Arabs. But it's God's land, Israel. It's always been His land. So the reason He continues to do all these things for the Jewish people, even today, I mean, look at the 48 war, the 67 war, the 1973 war, all these wars where they've said, we're going to eliminate the Jews, God has always stood up for them. It's, it's really miraculous. Now, after the soon-to-come Ezekiel 38 and 39 war, which is when all the enemies of Israel come against them in the Middle East, led by Russia, they're going to come down and they're, they're just going to think, we're going to take them. We're going to wipe them out. We're going to take over their land. And according to Ezekiel 39, God wipes out those armies that come against them. And throughout Ezekiel, it's over 60 times, God does all these things for the Israelites, saying that you may know that I am your Lord, your God. And so look at these verses. This is at the very end, after the battle has taken place. This is in Ezekiel 39, starting in verse 21. It says, And I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see my judgment which I have executed, and my hand which I have laid on them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. The Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity, because they were unfaithful to me. Therefore I hid my face from them. I gave them into the hand of their enemies, and they all fell by the sword, according to their uncleanness, and according to their transgressions. I have dealt with them, and hidden my face from them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will bring back the captives of Jacob, that's Israel, and have mercy on the whole house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my holy name, after they have borne their shame and all their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me when they dwelt safely in their own land and no one made them afraid. When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, again, since 1948, that's been what's happening, and I am hallowed in them in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their land, and have left none of them captive any longer. And I will not hide my face from them any more, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord. And that is still in the future. Israel has been, they will continue to be the apple of God's eye. That has not changed. And so anytime you hear about replacement theology, oh, the church has replaced you know, Israel. Those Jews, they're not even real Jews. That's not even really Israel. Don't buy into that. I mean, God's got so many promises. When people buy into that, they've thrown out two-thirds of the Bible because God has got a plan for the Jews in these last days. The 70th week of Daniel is all about Israel. Unfortunately, before they come to know Jesus as their Messiah, the Antichrist is going to come on the scene after the rapture takes place, the Antichrist shows up. He makes a peace treaty with them and the Arabs to rebuild or to build a temple on the Temple Mount. Unfortunately, three and a half years into that seven-year agreement, that's the Great Tribulation time, the Antichrist goes into the temple. This is according to Matthew 24, 15. 
Jesus quoting from Daniel 9, 24 to 27, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that's when the Antichrist goes into the rebuilt built temple and says, worship me, I am God. And the Jews, Jesus says, flee, get out of Jerusalem, get out of Israel, flee to the hills in the wilderness, and God would protect them. Unfortunately, two-thirds of the Jews will not flee. The Antichrist will put them to death. How do we know this? Zechariah, these verses say very clearly in chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire. This is referring to the Great Tribulation. will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. Now, when does that happen? At the second coming of Christ. When Jesus comes back, and we come back with him, the bride of Christ made up of saved Jews and us Gentiles. We come back with the Lord and then they will recognize Jesus is our Messiah. Romans chapter 11, 25 and 26 says, Thus all Israel will be saved when they see their deliverer. That's Jesus. And so a day is coming when they will all come to the Lord. They will all enter into the millennial reign of Christ where Jesus rules and reigns for a thousand years. At his second coming, he establishes his kingdom on earth from Jerusalem and the whole world is going to come and be blessed and worship the Lord. It's going to be amazing. And so, recently I was talking to somebody who says, well, you know what? This pastor over here, and he's probably got his PhDs and all these other degrees, says we're in the millennium now. Are you kidding me? This is the millennial reign of Christ? He's ruling and reigning from Jerusalem today? No, he's not. This is when the lion is lying down with the lamb? No, it's not happening. This is when everybody's going to beat their weapons into plowshares and they're going to be working the field? No. When Jesus comes back from heaven to earth, it's literal, not some spiritual thing. We are not in the millennial reign of Christ. It is still future, at least seven years away. Think about it. The rapture happens today. It'll be about seven years. We'll be coming back with the Lord. Be that as it may. Look at verse 11. I better get back on track here. God promises Moses that he will drive out these pagan people from the land of Israel. Uh, again, God gave these people over 400 years to repent. All these groups in verse 11, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and all these other parasites, he says, I gave them 400 years. And yet they got more wicked. They got more evil. They were doing horrible things to their own people. Look at them as squatters. Some of you have seen in the news recently, somebody goes on vacation. They come back and there's these strangers living in their house. They took it over. And then it becomes a real headache to try to get them out. It's your house. This is happening all over the place. That's how God looked at the people there in his land in Israel. He gave them 400 years while the Jews were in Egypt, all that time to repent and get right. But what were they doing? They were sacrificing their babies to the god Molech. They were offering up human sacrifices to Baal. They were worshiping Ashtoreth. They had all these weird, gross things taking place. And so, we'll, you know, God says he will kick them out of his land. God says to Joshua, Joshua 1, verse 3, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. In other words, Joshua, just take a step of faith. Wherever you put your land, in my land, Israel, it's going to be yours. Now, the Jews never got all the land God promised them. They will during the millennial reign of Christ, but they've only had about 10% of the promised land. It goes all the way past Jordan. They stopped. They only kicked the Jordanians out of Jerusalem. And then they went over to the other side of the Jordan River. But all of Jordan is included. Go all the way up to the Euphrates River. That's all part of God's promised land of the Jews. They've never had all that God promised. But wherever Joshua and the Israelites put their feet, God gave it to them. Now, that's true for all of us as followers of Christ. For all those who were against us, for all those things that kept us in bondage, 
for all those areas of our lives we can never change on our own. God steps in, and the risen Savior steps in, and He sets us free. He gives us victory if we will walk by faith, if we will step out and say, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I need you, and he will give us the victory. Suddenly, all those enemies we could not defeat in our own strength are driven out by God, even as he would drive out the enemies before the Israelites. Also notice in verse 12 that after God renews his covenant with the people, he gives them a warning. Take heed to yourself lest you make a covenant with those wicked people who are in my land. Don't make a covenant with them. This is why the Jews today cannot have a peace treaty with the people of Gaza or Hezbollah. Hamas has already said, we're not going to be satisfied with a part of this land. We want all of it. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. That's their mantra to say we want to destroy and annihilate every Jew. That has never changed. That's in all of those hardcore Muslims charters. Hezbollah, the same thing. Iran, the same thing. They're behind it all. And from the river, the Jordan River, to the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, they want to take it all. So when you hear our president say, oh yeah, let's just divide Israel in half. Two-state solution. Netanyahu's smart enough to know there can be no two-state solution. When your enemy says we want to annihilate you, how do you have peace with that? You can't. It's never going to work. Yasser Arafat, he was the one that started this whole mess with the Palestinian organization, the Palestinian army. And, and so he said, yeah, we'll take half of it, but that'll be the first step in taking all of it. And, and so they can't have two-state solution. The war could end today if they would surrender all the hostages, but all those leaders like Sinwar there in Gaza, they know if we do, we're going to be dead. Yesterday, the the Gazans, whatever you want to call them, Hamas, claimed to have taken an IDF soldier. And everybody in Gaza was celebrating. That's the heart of the people of Gaza. When we say there's, oh, there's a lot of innocent people there, there's very, very few innocent people in, in Gaza. They celebrated the rape, murder, beheading, the burning of babies in ovens on October 7th. They were passing out candy. Yesterday they were doing the same thing when they were told... And Amir said, no, they didn't really. That was a rumor they put out there. To see all these people celebrating because they captured an IDF soldier, which they didn't. But it just shows where their heart is. They hate the Jews. It's so sad because, again, what God loves, the world hates. What God hates, the world loves. They'll call evil good and good evil. And that's what Isaiah 5.20 tells us. So, don't make a covenant with them, God says. You and I, don't make a covenant with the world around us. Don't make a covenant with the vain philosophies of men around us because they will try to rip you off. They will try to undermine your faith in the Lord. Jesus said of the enemy, he came to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I came that you might have life and that more abundantly. Our covenant was with him. It's not with Washington, D.C. It's not with any world leader. Certainly not with the lies of the enemy. It's got to be with Jesus Christ. So here God says, have no other gods because they will be a snare. They will destroy, you know, you need to destroy their altars, break down their sacred pillars, cut these things down, their idols, because all these things are against the Lord and they're against you and they want to bring you back into bondage. Now, the main reason God says this in verse 14 is, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Usually we think of jealousy as being something negative or bad. Oh, don't be jealous or envious. Don't be angry. Now, it can be bad, but Paul says be angry, but don't let the sun go down in your wrath. What's he talking about? Righteous indignation. You should be angry about certain things that are taking place. Are you angry that they're slaughtering babies in the womb? That should make you angry. Are you angry when they are kidnapping all these children and sex trafficking them? That should make you angry. Anti-Semitism. That makes me angry. They don't realize these are God's chosen. He's not done with them yet. 
They still need Messiah Jesus, but we should be angry about those things that God is angry with. We should also be jealous for certain things. If you're married, then you have entered into a covenant with your spouse and with God. And if anyone tries to come between you and your spouse, that should bring some sense of jealousy into your heart. Why? Because I love my wife. And if anybody tries to put a wedge between me and Elizabeth, I'll get angry. I'll be jealous. It's not right. And how much more is God jealous for us? That's why he doesn't want us cozying up to the sinful things of this world. Because he loves us. He's got a better plan than the things of this world. Even the Apostle Paul says to the people of Corinth, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. Paul says, For I am jealous for you with, notice, a godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband. In other words, you're engaged you know, to one husband, Jesus, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So God doesn't want anything from this world coming between you and Jesus, between us and the Lord, period. I believe that is what the Apostle Paul had in mind in Ephesians 4 when he's exhorting the Christians there to put off all these corrupt things. Get rid of these things out of your life. You know, put on Christ. Colossians 3 goes into, you know, set your mind on things above where Christ is, not on the things of this earth, for you've died and your life is hidden with God in Christ Jesus. Why do we need to put these things off? Because those things of the world will hinder our intimate relationship with the Lord. So Paul says in Ephesians 4.30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Now, verses 18 to 28. Again, God is going to repeat himself. Uh, we'll go through these quickly. It's not because God forgets. But so he reminds us, this is what I said. I'm going to follow through on what I said. So look at verse 18. It says, The feast of unleavened bread you shall keep. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you in the appointed time of the month of Abib. For in the month of Abib you came out from Egypt. And so again, Passover, feast of unleavened bread were linked together that seven days. Passover, they put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts, on the lintels, when the death angel passed over, the angel saw the blood, the blood of the lamb, and so they were spared. Jesus is our Passover lamb. The enemy can't harm us because we have the blood of Jesus upon our lives. He has washed us clean. We're new creations in Christ. He is the unleavened bread, the bread of life. We feast upon him. All who are hungry and thirsty, he alone will satisfy. Verse 19, he says, All that open the womb are mine, and every male firstborn among the livestock, whether ox or sheep. You know, God's the one that gives life. He's the one, these belong to me. But the firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. I always like to look at that and say, Well, if the lamb is represented by Jesus, who does the donkey represent? Look in the mirror. <laughs> Yeah, the old, the old King James has a different word there. But the firstborn of the donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, and if you will not redeem him, then you shall break his neck. If you're not redeemed by the blood of the lamb, you'll end up dead forever in the lake of fire, weeping and gnashing of teeth. All the firstborn of your sons shall, uh, you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. So again, this is like the fourth time he's reiterated the fact that the Sabbath, it's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. That's why it's okay to worship on Sunday. I'm not Jewish. I'm pagan Gentile that came to Christ. And so this is for the Jews. And you shall observe the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest in the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Three times in the year, all your men shall appear before the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. And it became, you know, something when they came into the land and the temple was built, every, uh, those three feast days with uh, Pentecost, or Passover, then Pentecost, then the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. Those were the three required feasts. Everybody would flock 
to Jerusalem. They would go from about 250,000 people to about 2.5 million people during those feast days. It wasn't just the men that were required. Well, they were the only ones required, but it became a family thing. We're going to Jerusalem. We're going to the temple. We're going to worship the Lord. And it was a great thing that they observed for many, many years. Then he says in verse 24, For I will cast out the nations before you and enlarge your borders. Neither will any man covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, nor shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left until morning. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. So if you go to Israel, and we, we were planning on going next March, we'll see. But when you go there, you'll never, when you go to any restaurant or in the hotels, they will never have meat products or uh, dairy products on the same table. And this is where they take it from. But that's not what it's referring to. They're saying you shall not boil a baby goat in its mother's milk. That was a pagan thing. They would offer up a, a pagan sacrifice by boiling the baby goat in its mother's milk. So the Jews have taken it so far out there, you can't have yogurt and meat. That's not what it's referring to, so just give you a heads up if you're ever in Israel. That's why you'll see, why is there no meat with this dairy product? That's why. Um, Verse 27, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you with, and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. This is the second time now. He neither ate bread nor drank water, so God miraculously provided for him. And he wrote on, he, capital H, that's God, God wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And so again, God is doing all these things on their behalf. And it's really saying, okay, test me. My people, test me. When you go to these feast days, I will protect your, your home. Test me. When you observe the Sabbath, don't plant on the day of harvest. Don't plant, you know, uh, or don't reap on the day of harvest. Don't plant when, you know, in early spring on the Sabbath. Test me. Because if we put God to the test, he says, I will bless you. The, the Israelites got in trouble so many times because they started working on the Sabbath. They started doing all these things on the Sabbath. And God said, no. That's the, end, the reason they ended up 70 years in Babylon in, in captivity because they did not keep the Sabbath rest of the land because every seven years they would let the land go fallow. And they didn't do it for 490 years. So God says, you owe me 70 years. And that's why there were 70 years in Babylon. So be that as it may, we need to put the Lord to the test. Now, sometimes we can make the mistake of looking at God's goodness and kindness as God approving sinful actions. Well, I'm waiting for a lightning bolt because I just did something again that I shouldn't do. Oh, he didn't hit me with a two-by-four. I didn't get struck by lightning. Well, maybe God's approving this. Maybe, you know, I'm making a bigger deal out of this sin than God is. Maybe God thinks it's okay for me to do these things. A thousand times, no. Don't think that God's patience means acceptance of sin. A day is coming when He will deal with you, because whom the Lord loves, He disciplines. Yes, God is gracious and merciful, but He never approves of wickedness and sin. Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8 says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Romans 2, 4, Paul says, Do you despise? Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? In other words, the whole purpose of God's goodness and grace is not to show acceptance of our sin, but His goodness and grace is giving us time. It's giving us an opportunity to repent and get back in that right relationship with the Lord. Again, the Bible says, surely your sins will find you out. In other words, eventually God will say, okay, son, okay, daughter, 
let's go behind the woodshed. You know, when the Lord loves, He disciplines. You know, I don't want to see you hurt yourself or others any longer. So now check out what happens with Moses. We'll wrap this up here in verse 29. It says, Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain. Now Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone. I mean, he's radiating. And they were afraid to come near him. Oh, no, what happened to our brother? Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. It's like, hey, guys, it's still me. Try to ignore my face on fire. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out, and he would come out and speak with the children of Israel, whatever he had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses shone, his face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. So what an amazing experience. I mean, his face is lit up, and it was a result of being in God's presence Now, when all the people saw this, it says they're afraid. I mean, again, what would you think if you walked out of here, you go out in the parking lot, but your face is just radiating? I mean, it would be weird. It would be amazing. Now, it's interesting that whenever Moses went into the tent to talk to God, when he came out, you know, it says his face was shining. But before he went back in, he would put a veil over his face. Why? Because after a while, the light would start to dim the light from his face would start to fade. And that's how the Apostle Paul describes what was happening with Moses here. Paul contrasts what was happening to Moses under the Old Covenant with those who put themselves back under the law. Paul contrasts the Old Covenant of the law with the New Covenant we have with Jesus. Under the law, you're going to try hard, you're going to burn out. Under the New Covenant, You just rest in Jesus, and he works from the inside out. And that glorification process is ongoing. You're not going to dim out. You're going to get brighter and brighter, especially when we get into the presence of the Lord. Paul says in Galatians 3.24, because there's no transformational power in the law, he says, therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under the tutor. And so there's glory in the old covenant. But compared to the new covenant, the new covenant is much more glorious. You've got to catch this fact. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, where he refers to what Moses is experiencing there. Look at 2 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 7. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones, was glorious. What's the the ministry of death? That's the law. The law doesn't save us. The law shows us that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. No one's declared righteous by the law. You're declared righteous by Jesus, who alone fulfilled all the law. So that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. How will the ministry of the Spirit, this new covenant we have, not be more glorious? Now, if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. That's the new covenant. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. So compared to the old covenant, the new covenant is infinitely more glorious. Yeah, there's glory in the old covenant, But when you compare that with what Jesus has done, how glorious he is, all that he's accomplished for us, dying in our place, giving us eternal life, how much more glorious is that? Therefore, verse 12, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But in their minds... 
but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Covenant, because the veil is taken away in Christ. It's amazing to me, and we've had a lot of you know Jews come here that are Messianic Jews over the years, and they'll tell you, you know, before they came to Jesus as Messiah, they would read the Old Covenant. Every Sabbath, the Old Covenant is read. Verses like Isaiah chapter 53, that whole section, speaking of Jesus and what He would accomplish for us. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way, but the Lord laid on Him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. They can't see it. The blinders are on them. But the blinders, He says, the veil is taking away in Christ. But even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So ultimately, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, Paul says, to who first? To the Jew first, and also to us Gentiles, the Greeks. That's why the gospel is so important to share. Not just being friends with the Jewish people. We need to be friends, but we also need to share the truth of who their Messiah really is. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of God. That's amazing. This is a great advantage we have under the new covenant. Our transformation of the Holy Spirit is going from glory to greater glory. Uh, again, just look back to when you first got saved. Did you know everything there was to know about God? No. Everything that Jesus did for you on the cross? I didn't. I knew He loved me. I knew He died for me. I mean, I couldn't put it into doctrinal terms, theological terms, all that He has done. But as you grow in the Lord, it's like, wow, it's amazing that you would love a, a, a jerk like me. It's amazing that you would love, you know, a wretch like me. And, and like Paul says, I'm the least of all the saints. And then he says, I'm least of all the apostles. As he grew older in the Lord, he says, now I'm the chief of sinners. Because he realized the closer he got to the Lord, the more he didn't deserve anything from God. It was all because of God's grace. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, just as I also am known. And simply by abiding in Christ, we're being changed from the inside out. God has started a very, very good work in your life. Look at this last verse, Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that He who has begun a good work in you, a moment of salvation, He started a new work in your life. He who begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. At the rapture, or when this carcass falls over and I die, we're going to be in His presence, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. And then we will know fully, even as we're fully known, then we will experience that completeness that we have in Jesus. Yes, Paul says we are complete today, positionally, but I'm certainly not what I'm going to be, and neither are you. Praise the Lord, I'm not what I used to be, but praise the Lord, I'm not what I'm going to be going to be a whole lot better because of His grace and His mercy and His glorification process in all of our lives when we see Him face to face. 